Before I get, begin this morning, first I want to give a greeting to those of you at our South Street campus, my South Street campus family. Well, I'm glad to be able to be with you via video this morning. I'd much rather be with you in person and I hope to do that next Sunday morning uh, there at South Street. Secondly, uh, I want to let you all know that you should have received, most of you should have received an email uh, late Friday afternoon uh, announcing that the Executive Council has called a church family meeting for this coming Saturday evening, 7 p.m. here at the Kessinger campus. And the purpose of that meeting is for the Executive Council to give an update on the process we're in as a church family and to hear directly from Pastor Jeff. Now, you need to know this meeting will not be recorded, so if you want to uh, be a part of it, you need to be here in person. Again, that's this coming Saturday evening, March 16th, 7 p.m., right here at Kelsinger campus. And the last thing is Kim did a great job describing what happened here yesterday. My wife and I were here with three of our, three, our three grandkids. And um, I know the burning question is some of you, how many were here by the way at the extravaganza? Brought your kids out. Uh, the burning question you might have is how many eggs were there? They were everywhere. 15,000 eggs in this campus. And then you're wondering after that, how many donut holes were there? That's what I was wondering about coming over. 7,000 donut holes, and there's extras left over out there. You get a bonus for being here at 8 a.m. if you want to go. Some of you discovered already. I saw you coming in with the little cups full of donut holes. But thank you so much uh, for, to Becky and her staff, kids staff, and to the Army of volunteers that made that day possible. Just a wonderful event. There's another one coming up this Saturday at our North Aurora campus. Well, I've shared before that my mom grew up in the hills of eastern Kentucky in Pike County, to be exact. Now, Pike County there in the red is way off to the eastern edge of Kentucky, uh, bordering on West Virginia to the north and Virginia to the south. It's a region known for its mountains, coal mines, and its poverty. We call it Appalachia today. And when my mom was growing up, it was also known for stills and moonshine. Here's the earliest photo I have of my mom. She's at the cabin of a friend's house near where she grew up. My mom didn't have indoor plumbing until she was 19 years old. Uh, her father's name was Noah Sloan, my grandfather. Uh, he was the youngest of 10 children. Now, that was an unusual in Mountain family. Some of them had 14 kids, 17 kids, just, a, just really large families. Uh, Noah had seven brothers. Uh, his oldest, was, oldest brother was Jeff, and his full name was Thomas Jefferson Sloan. Wiley, Alec, Dan, Plez, Lark, and Harlan. And he had two sisters, one named Arizona and the other named Derona. The sister Arizona married a man named Canada, so her name ended up being Arizona Canada. I'm not making this up. You can look it up on Ancestry.com. My mother's mother, my grandmother's name was Neva Jo Sloan. Ne excuse me, Neva Jo Branham Sloan. And, and Neva Jo's uncle, my mother's great uncle, my great great uncle, was a man named Clifton Branham, who happened to be the last man hanged in Wise County, Virginia. This is an actual photo that's been colorized and um, enhanced. Uh, it's from 1900 or so. And by all accounts, Clinton was a very troubled man. Believed to have been a moonshiner early in his life, he eventually graduated to, from making whiskey to killing at least two men for money uh, and trying to kill several more. He served 15 years for one murder and while in prison became a preacher of the gospel. Go figure. Uh, and then he was paroled. And after he got out, he promptly got into some sort of domestic quarrel and killed his wife with a shotgun. And this time he was sentenced to hang for his crime. The story goes that before he was taken to the gallows, he was given one last request. He asked for his guitar and he sang a hymn and then he was hanged. This is the actual report from a newspaper in September of 1903. Clifton's body was hauled back to Dickinson County by family members in a horse-drawn wagon. People came out of the hills all along the road to try to catch a glimpse of the body going by. Clifton had allegedly requested to have a wake and said on the third day he would arise from the dead. When the third day came, naturally, everyone anxiously waited near his homemade coffin. But the third day passed without incident, it says. There's another report that says that when they opened the coffin to check on him, they noticed what looked like beads of sweat on his forehead. Probably condensation of some kind. But I like to think he was really trying. 
It's a little gruesome way to start. But we're in the fourth week of a series called Unrecognized King. We're looking at seven stories uh, from the tail end of Jesus' earthly life and ministry, coming mostly from the Gospel of John. And in each story, we're seeing that Jesus makes a statement about himself, something about his identity or his authority. And in, uh, and in several, he also does a miracle, what John calls a sign. And then in each story, there's a person or group of people who fail to recognize him. He says, I am this, and they say, no, you're not, and so the story goes. In John 6, he said, I am the bread of life, using physical hunger to teach about spiritual hunger. Then in John 8 and 9, he says, I am the light of the world, using physical blindness to teach about spiritual blindness. Last week, we were in John 10, when he says, I am the good shepherd who lays down his life for the sheep. And today, we look at perhaps the most famous of all the miracles or signs of Jesus, and that is a man who did indeed rise from the dead. We're going to be in John chapter 11 today. It's a long narrative story, so I'm going to read parts of it, and then we'll teach our way through it. John chapter 11, beginning in verse 1. Now, a man named Lazarus was sick. He was from Bethany, the village of Mary and her sister Martha. This Mary, whose brother Lazarus now lay sick, was the same one who poured perfume on the Lord and wiped his feet with her hair. So the sisters sent word to Jesus, Lord, the one you love is sick. And pause there for a moment. Here we meet three of Jesus' closest personal friends, a man named Lazarus and his two sisters, Mary and Martha. Uh, we're told they live in a little village called Bethany, which was kind of a suburb of Jerusalem, a mile and a half or so outside the city. The sisters send word that Lazarus is sick. And what's really being said here is they're saying, Jesus, will you please come quickly? Verse 4. When he heard this, Jesus said, this sickness will not end in death. No, it is for God's glory so that the God's son may be glorified through it. Now that sounds a little like, actually a lot like, Jesus is planning to heal Lazarus as he did the man born blind from a couple of weeks ago. Verse 5, now Jesus loved Martha and her sister Lazarus, and her, and her sister and Lazarus. So when he heard that Lazarus was sick, he stayed where he was two more days. And then he said to his disciples, let us go back to Judea. I hope you noticed that. And something in your brain went, whoa, 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 hang on a second. Didn't we just read that Jesus loved his friend Lazarus and his sisters? Didn't the sisters just send an urgent request to him that their brother, his friend that he loves is sick? Would he come quickly? And then it says, and he waits two days before deciding to make a visit. He had left Jerusalem uh, earlier because there was the threat of being stoned to death. And now he's a two days walk from Bethany and yet he waits two more days. Why? What's going on here? Verse eight. But Rabbi, they said, a short while ago, the Jews there tried to stone you and yet you're going back. The disciples are shocked that he's even thinking about going back to that area of Jerusalem, Judea, because he's got serious enemies there. Verse 11, after he had said this, he went on to tell them, our friend Lazarus has fallen asleep, but I am going there to wake him up. His disciples replied, Lord, if he sleeps, he will get better. Jesus had been speaking of his death, but his disciples thought he meant natural sleep. So then he told them plainly, Lazarus is dead. And for your sake, I'm glad I was not there so that you may believe, but let us go to him. So Jesus waits he allows, it seems, his friend, a friend he loves, to die. And then he says he is glad he was not there. And the only reason he gives is that you may believe. We'll come back to that in a moment. Verse 16, then Thomas, also known as Didymus, said to the rest of the disciples, let us go also that we may die with him. I want to take a little detour here um, to talk about Thomas. Thomas, I think, is one of my favorite characters in the whole story of Jesus. I know he's called Doubting Thomas for reasons I'll explain in a minute, but I like to think of him as, as more like Honest Thomas, more like Tell It Like It Is Thomas. We know that later, when he heard the story of Jesus' resurrection from others, he says, I'll believe it when I see it. Unless I see and touch, I will not believe. And I think that's what probably most of us would have said or thought when told someone had risen from the dead. I think that's what friends and relatives said about old Uncle Clifton. But when Thomas saw the evidence, the Bible tells us, 
the wounds in Jesus' hands and side, he fell on his knees and he said, my Lord and my God. Here he wants, Jesus wants to go back to Judea and Thomas sees clearly what's likely going to happen. Jesus is going to die because he knows the enemies that are there. He saw them pick up the stones and yet he says, let, also, let us also go with him that we may die with him. There was nothing phony about Thomas' faith. So at this point in the story, we see, first of all, the mystery of Jesus. The mystery of Jesus. As a pastor, and this is true of all our pastors and any pastor, one of my most sacred responsibilities and actually privileges is to walk with people, with families, through the dark times of losing a loved one. Um, nearly 25 years ago, in June of 2000, a family in our church lost their 16-month-old daughter when she wandered off, everybody was at home, she wandered off and found her way to their backyard above ground pool. The gate was locked and closed, but evidently there was a, a warped board in the fencing, just big enough for her to squeeze her way through, and by the time they realized where she was, it was too late. Paramedics couldn't save her life. It was heartbreaking devastating. Even as, I, even as I led that funeral with a tiny casket down front, I could feel, I could feel the anguished questions, not only in the family and in, in the friends that were gathered, but in, in my own heart. Why? Why? Where were you? God. My guess is anyone here this morning who's lost a loved one or particularly a young person from your family, you know what I'm talking about. Here we see that Jesus receives word that his good friend, one he loves, is sick. He waits two whole days before beginning a two days long journey. He says, Lazarus is dead. And for your sake, I'm glad I was not there. What do we make of this? Is Jesus callous and indifferent and cold? No, we're told he loves these friends. Is Jesus glad that death has wreaked havoc on his friends' lives? No. He seems to know something that neither his disciples nor Mary and Martha know or have any idea of. He seems to be operating on a set of assumptions or truths or perspectives that they just don't understand. And we struggle with those too. And here I think is the mystery of Jesus. He doesn't answer the why questions, at least not directly. But he does go about answering the who question. Verse 17, on his arrival, Jesus found that Lazarus had already been in the tomb for four days. Remember, he waited two days and then he walked for two days. Now, evidently, there was an ancient belief in that, in that uh, culture that a dead person's soul sort of remained or hung around the body for about three days and then departed, and then the body would begin to decay on the fourth day. So he's been in the tomb four days. Verse 18, now Bethany was less than two miles from Jerusalem, and many Jews had come to Martha and Mary to comfort them in the loss of their brother. When Martha heard that Jesus was coming, she went out to meet him, but Mary stayed home. Lord, Martha said to Jesus, if you had been here, my brother would not have died. I wonder if you can hear the pain in her voice through the centuries. Can you hear the question in her statement? Lord, if you had been here, why didn't you come when we asked you to come? Why did you wait two whole days? Why didn't you intervene? We know you healed others, the blind man. Why didn't you heal our brother? Now, I think most of us have asked questions like that at one time or another. Maybe not out loud, but inside ourselves. Martha continues, verse 22. But I know that even now God will give you whatever you ask. And Jesus said to her, your brother will rise again. Martha answered, I know he will rise again in the resurrection at the last day. Now, many ancient Jews believed that in the last day, there would be a general resurrection of the dead for the purpose of final judgment by God. But Jesus isn't talking about that. 
Verse 25, Jesus said to her, I am the resurrection and the life. The one who believes in me will live even though they die. And whoever lives by believing in me will never die. Do you believe this? Yes, Lord, she replied. I believe that you are the Messiah, the Son of God, who has come into the world. And remember the purpose of John's gospel? We went over this a couple of times a few weeks ago. He writes that, that he tells, he writes his story that you may believe that Jesus is the Messiah and that by believing, you will have life in his name. And here we have Martha's confession of faith. Here is something new. This is not faith in sort of a general resurrection for judgment at the last day. This is a specific faith in Jesus who is himself the resurrection and the life. The mystery of Jesus. Secondly, we see here in the story, the grief of Jesus. The grief of Jesus. Like many children, my first experience of death came when I was about 10 years old with the death of a pet. Our family dog, a little dachshund terrier named Sugar, uh, was hit by a car right in front of our house as I watched. This is me and my younger brother Joe with our little dog Sugar about a year before she was killed. We were all outside as a family waiting to be picked up to go somewhere else with another family. And when no one was paying attention, Sugar kind of ran across the, the really busy road that ran in front of our house where we lived. And when my dad noticed that she was across the way, he whistled for her. Yeah, that same whistle I talked about last week. And she always responded to that whistle, just like we did. And she picked up her head and came sprinting back across the road directly into the path of an oncoming car. Just like that. Gone. At 10 years old, I can still remember the shock of that, the numbness, that strange, empty feeling deep inside I'd never known before, but a feeling I would know again later in life with greater losses than that. I remember feeling this collision of emotions that I could not wrap my head around. Uh, I, I, the confusion and sadness and anger and shock. How could something so terrible happen so randomly? So quickly, my 10-year-old way of asking why. Verse 33, when Jesus saw her weeping and the Jews who had come along with her also weeping, he was deeply moved in spirit and troubled. I want you to notice that phrase. He was deeply moved in spirit and troubled. Where have you laid him? He asked. Come and see, Lord, they replied. Jesus wept. Then the Jews said, see how he loved him. But some of them said, could not he who opened the eyes of the blind man have kept this man from dying? We need to see Jesus' response here. John eleven thirty five. 35. Some of you know it's the shortest verse in the Bible. Two words. Jesus wept. But for me, not just the shortest, but one of the most significant, meaningful verses in the Bible. Jesus wept at the death of of his friend. Now think about that just for a moment. This is Jesus, the one we believe is the eternal word through whom all things were created, who will one day redeem and recreate all things in the new heaven and new earth, who in a moment will call Lazarus from death to life by simply speaking his name. This Jesus weeps at the death of a friend. It's extraordinary. And I think Jesus weeps for three reasons. First, personal grief. Just his personal grief. John tells us that those watching knew instinctively that Jesus' tears were the result of his love for his friend. They said, look, see how he loved him. This is so human and so real. Jesus is teaching us something about both love and grief. And I think by his own tears, he's validating, honoring, and entering into our pain, our tears, our grief. I think he's teaching us that our grief is always a result of love. We only grieve that which we love. And we love and we grieve because we're created in the image of a God who loves and grieves. Did you know that God grieves? In Genesis chapter 6, we read, The Lord saw that the wickedness of man was great in the earth and that every intention of the thoughts of his heart was only evil continually. And the Lord regretted that he made man on the earth and it grieved him. To his heart. This is what we see here in Jesus. He grieves personally, but he also grieves over sin and death in the world. 
I told you to notice that little phrase. He was deeply moved in his spirit and greatly troubled. The, John uses a word here that's in the, in the original language that's really difficult to translate. Uh, the word that is translated deeply moved actually means, if you look it up, to be moved with anger or indignation. It means to roar or snort with anger like a horse. That was how it was used in the ancient world. The late Tim Keller says the most accurate translation of the word could be to bellow with anger. In his book called Encounter with Jesus, he writes, Jesus is absolutely furious. He's bellowing with rage. He's roaring. Jesus is raging against, against death. He did not make a world filled with sickness, suffering, and death. Jesus' grief here is filled with anger toward his enemy, sin, and death. He's raging against a little girl drowning in her backyard pool. No parent should ever have to bury a child. It should not be this way. I did not create it to be this way. He's raging against 68 mass shootings in the U.S. since January 1st this year. That should not be this way. He's raging against the violence in Gaza and Israel. It should not be this way. He's raging against a little boy experiencing grief for the first time when his pet dog is run over by a car in front of his eyes. It should not be this way. This is not how I made the world. And Jesus is filled with rage against his enemy of sin and death. Against the one who introduced all that into the world, his enemy, Satan himself, the serpent in the garden, the one called the liar, the deceiver, the destroyer, the one he will ultimately defeat only through his own death and resurrection. Jesus grieves the brokenness of the world and his grief is filled with a kind of holy rage. But thirdly, Jesus also weeps because he knows the price that must be paid. Again, Tim Keller writes, that's why when Jesus approached the tomb, instead of smiling at the prospect of putting on a great show, he was shaking with anger and had tears on his cheeks. He knew what it would cost him to save us from death. You see, at a deeper level, Jesus here is offering a great substitution. He's going to call Lazarus out of the tomb because he is going to enter into a tomb. Remember, last week in John chapter 10, Jesus said, I have the authority to lay my life down, and I have the authority to take it up again. The only way for Jesus to be the resurrection and the life is for him to die first. Because in order for there to be a resurrection, there has to be a death. That leads us to the third thing today, and that is the promise of Jesus. The promise of Jesus. Over the last three years about, I've done a little, uh, uh, something like 40 funerals. Did one this past Tuesday for dear friend, Dr. Gil Beers from South Street Campus. And almost every funeral I do, I refer to the story of Lazarus right here, John chapter 11. Some of you have heard me do that. And almost every time I mention the agonized and brutally honest question of the sisters. Why? Why did you not come? And I always point out that Jesus does not answer their question directly. He just goes about doing something else. Back in verses 25, 26, we read, Jesus said to her, I am the resurrection and the life. The one who believes in me will live even though they die. Whoever lives by believing in me will never die. Do you believe this? And this is the spiritual center of this long narrative story. And it's the center not just of the story of Lazarus, but of the story of Jesus, the whole story of Jesus, the whole gospel. And not just that, it's the center of the entire story of the Bible from beginning to end. This is the turning point of all human history and the turning point of your personal history, of my personal history. All the way through John's gospel, he has pointed to Jesus as the source of life. In chapter one, he says, in him was life, and that life was the light of men. In chapter three, he says, for God so loved the world that he gave his one and only son that whoever believes in him shall not perish but have what? Everlasting life. In John four, Jesus says to the Samaritan woman at the well, a story we'll look at this summer, the water I give will become a spring of water welling up into eternal life. In John 10, Jesus says, I am the good shepherd who lays down his life for the sheep that they will have life 
and have it more abundantly. And now Jesus promises to bring life from death itself. And he demonstrates his authority to deliver on that promise. Verse 38, Jesus, once more deeply moved, same word, I want you to try to feel this, try to see this in your mind's eye. This is Jesus with tears still streaming down his face, his chest heaving with anger and compassion and grief. He comes to the tomb. It was a cave with a stone laid across the entrance. Take away the stone, he said. But Lord, said Martha, the sister of the dead man, by this time there is a bad odor, for he has been there four days. Then Jesus said, did I not tell you that if you believe you will see the glory of God? So they took away the stone, and Jesus looked up and said, Father, I thank you that you have heard me. I knew that you always hear me, but I said this for the benefit of the people standing here that they may believe that you sent me. When he said this, Jesus called in a loud voice. It means Jesus shouted, Jesus yelled, Jesus screamed in a voice to wake the dead, Lazarus, come out. And the dead man came out. His hands and feet wrapped in strips of linen and a cloth around his feet. Jesus said, face, Jesus said to them, take off the grave clothes and let him go. Now, right here we're tempted to focus on Lazarus, right? The, the dead man walking out of the tomb is the miracle and rightly so. But Lazarus coming back to life isn't really the point here. I hate to say this, it's kind of a buzzkill in a way. But Lazarus eventually had to die a second time. I always wanted to ask him about that. In fact, we know with 100% certainty that every single person Jesus healed in his ministry, the lame, the lepers, the blind, every single one of them eventually died. Because the physical healing wasn't really the point. And that's so hard for us to, to understand because our perspective is so limited by this earthly life, by physical life. But Jesus is not limited by that perspective. The point is what Jesus says it is, that they may believe that you sent me. And now we come to the conclusion of the story, verse 45. Therefore, many of the Jews who came, who had come to visit Mary, had seen what Jesus did, believed in him. But some of them went to the Pharisees and told them what Jesus had done. Then the chief priests and the Pharisees called a meeting of the Sanhedrin. Now the Sanhedrin was like the Supreme Court of Israel. It was made up of 70 men and the high priest who conducted the most important trials, who made the most important decisions. What are we accomplishing, they asked. Here is this man performing many signs. If we let him go on like this, everyone will believe in him. And then the Romans will come and take away our temple and our nation. Then one of them named Caiaphas, who was the high priest that year, spoke up. You know nothing at all. You do not realize that it is better for you that one man die for the people than that the whole nation perish. So Jesus says, I am the resurrection and the life. And then to prove it, he calls a dead man from the tomb by shouting his name, and we see mixed reactions. Some believe. Some report him to the Pharisees. A special meeting is called. They say, if he keeps doing stuff like this, everyone's gonna believe in him. And the Romans are gonna take away our temple. We're gonna talk about the temple next week. Then comes Caiaphas, the high priest. We see the magnificent irony of Caiaphas. Don't you realize it's better for the one man to die for the people than for the whole nation to perish? That's the whole point of the story. Remember what Jesus said, I am the good shepherd who lays down his life for the sheep. I think John really wants us to find ourselves in this story. He wants us to see that we're all like Lazarus, the dead man because we're all going to face physical death and Jesus promises to call us to life. We are all the grieving sisters in a way because we're all gonna know the crushing loss of losing loved ones and asking the question, why? And Jesus promises to enter into our grief and pain with us. 
We may be among those who believe in him. Or we may be in, among those who fail to recognize him for all kinds of reasons. You know, it's a fairy tale. It's not scientific. But Caiaphas was right about two things. It is better for one man to die than for all to perish. Sin and death are in this world and in each one of us. And Jesus calls our names, shouts our names to wake the dead, to bring them to the living. And he offers to take our place in that tomb. Second thing Caiaphas is right about is if you're not going to recognize Jesus as who he is and believe, then you best get rid of him. You best kill him. And I can promise you this with great certainty. A day is coming, maybe decades from now, maybe a few years from now, maybe months from now, when the only question that will matter to you or to anyone who loves you is how you answer the question that Jesus asks in John chapter 11. I am the resurrection and the life. The one who believes in me will live even though they die. And whoever lives by believing in me will never die. Do you believe this? Bow with me in prayer. Lord God, thank you for your word. Thank you for your great love for us. For your tears of grief for your promise of resurrection life, for your willingness to take our place, to conquer sin and death in the world and in us. And it's in your name that we pray. Amen. Receive now today's benediction. May we go now in the powerful name and in the promise of our Lord Jesus Christ, the King, who is the resurrection and the life. Amen. Have a great day.